You're probably sitting there thinking, it's a little bit early in the morning to be talking about giving birth and it um, looks a bit, uh, a bit scary for those of you that haven't experienced um, being at a birth yourself. But um, as all of us have been born, my talk today is about that giving birth is important. And I was inspired by, to write the title of the talk by a poem by Carl Sandburg, which is actually called um, Being Born is Important. And he talks about those of you, and I'll probably quote him wrong now, but those of you who have um, been at a mother's high harvest day, when you've been at a mother's bedpost, when you've been at a birth, you understand how important it is being born. And um, I'm lucky enough to work as a doula. And uh, some of you probably think, well, what's that? And um, I've had quite a few people say to me, a doula? What? You make jewellery? I'm like, no, no. I'm a doula, which is a lay birth partner. So that means I'm not a midwife. I haven't had professional training. Um, it's what we call a lay professional recalling, like Molly was talking about um, finding your passion, finding what means something to you and um, for me being at births became something that was incredibly important to me um, there's me working with a couple of women but the reason that I started attending births um, was not particularly for human beings to begin with I actually attended animal births as a as a child and as a young adult I had cats and kittens and dogs. We also bred pedigree dogs and I was around animals giving birth. And um, that made me think about mammals and, and how they give birth and what they need to give birth. And um, as a young adult, we adopted a, a young female dog from a dog pound because she was going to be put down if um, she wasn't adopted within a week. And uh, they told us that she'd be neutered but actually she hadn't. So the first thing that she did when we got her home was to get jiggy with another dog. And, um, and she was a very young, small dog, quite undernourished. And we spent the pregnancy um, trying to feed her up and make sure she was healthy. And um, when she sort of got near to when she was going to be having the puppies, I made her a sort of a nest of um, sort of boxes with sort of bedding in for her to use and in a quiet space. And um, she actually went into labour and I was with her. I happened to be with her at the time. And the house was quiet and she started having her puppies. And because she was such a young dog, I was a bit worried about how, how was she going to manage? Will she know what to do? She's obviously not had puppies before. And um, she sort of seems to have all these instinctive behaviours. She gave birth to her first puppy and she automatically started to lick it and um, chew through... Well, again it's a bit early in the morning but chew through the umbilical cord and make sure that the puppy was breathing and um, she seemed to have these instinctive behaviors and I sat very quietly with her and just sort of like sat with her didn't really do anything and let her get on with it and in the midst of all that at that moment my um, partner at the time came back into the house with uh, our other dog and two other people and their dog and I immediately said no 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 the the dog's having her puppies, you will have to leave, you'll have to go somewhere else. And he was like, no, 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 she'll be fine, she'll just get on with it, you know, we'll just... So they came in, there was all this noise, and immediately the next puppy that she had, she left the puppy in its sack of um, bag of waters, um, didn't show any of the behaviour that she had before, she left it in a corner of where she'd been um, having the puppies, and walked away from it and didn't... Um, tear the sack or anything and I had to actually intervene and go in and, and take the puppy out of the sack and cut the umbilical cord and make sure it was breathing myself because she didn't do what she had been doing and it made me think well something has happened here the interference the people coming in the dogs coming in has interfered with her behavior and what she's doing and that actually that puppy would have died without me intervening and that has coloured what I do as a doula. So as a doula, if I come back to being a doula, I'm a lay birth partner, which means that I don't do any medical procedures. So I won't be cutting any umbilical cords or trying to help human babies out of their umbilical sacs. But what I do do is I support women um, emotionally and physically when they are giving birth. And... Um, 
And you think, well, women give birth every day. There's probably a woman in labour now. It might be somebody that you know. It might be somebody on your street. There will be women all around the world giving birth right now. So why do we, you know, obviously the body just gets on with it. Why do we need somebody else to help? You know, we've got midwives, we've got doctors. Why, why would we need a lay birth partner as well? And um, for me, I started listening. I had my own child um, and it wasn't a particularly wonderful experience. It wasn't a traumatic experience, but it didn't quite go the way that I'd hoped. When I went to my midwife appointments, I thought I'd be sitting there chatting away about my birth plan and what kind of pool I was going to be using. And actually, there was very little time for them to talk to you about anything relating to your birth plan. It was very much quick, have your blood pressure taken, listen to the baby's heart rate and get out. And um, I sort of felt a little bit bereft. I felt a little bit like I could have done with somebody to talk about these things in more detail and feel that maybe giving birth is about more than just a physical process, a baby being inside a mother and coming out of her body, that actually maybe that there was something sacred about giving birth, that actually creating another human life on this planet and then moving through your body and out into the world was something that was important and that was sacred and that should be seen as that and it, that it wasn't just a physical medical event. Um, and I also write poetry as well as um, work as a doula. And um, this is a poem that I wrote called Preparing the Way. We are lighting the candles creating a softly flickering light, soft velvet cushions and throws positioned around the room, freshly cut flowers. I warm oil between my hands and rub your shoulders, your hips, moving slowly down to the small of your back. You begin to moan softly as the minutes tick by. You slip sensuously into the bath, this love play going on and on into the night. You're moaning more intense now. Little cries slip from your slightly parted lips. Your eyes are glazed. I can taste the sweat between your breasts as your body writhes and bucks. My hands holding you steady and I kiss you in your pain and pleasure. Your face, your neck, your hands. I rub oil into your thighs, helping you to open, to relax and trust this, trust your body. Love cries in the room, primal sound. You are frightened now, begging me to stop this. It's too big. You will tear, please. Crying for it to stop, and I tell you, it can't stop. We must go on. We can't go back. You are biting my hand and roaring, fierce, powerful woman. You howl and scream, releasing, blessed release. Le petit mal, eyes roll back. You are so far gone, it takes a while for you to come back to place your hands on our hot, wet child's body, to see your baby's face for the first time, a mother born. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that giving birth is a rite of passage for women. So women who have never had a child before are in a state of what we might call maidenhood. They, are, they have not become a mother yet. They have not crossed that threshold. And a rite of passage, according to um, Wikipedia, is a ritual event that marks a person's progress from one status to another. It is a, un a universal phenomenon which can show anthropologists what social hierarchies, values, and beliefs are important in specific cultures. So if we see giving birth as a rite of passage for women and we look at how women give birth in the Western world and in this country, then that can show us the way in which our social culture is working and the way in which we honour women in that process of, of that rite of passage of becoming a mother. And we think about shows like One Born Every Minute. I don't know how many of you watch that or whether, whether you turn it off straight away when it's on because... You know, it can be quite frightening for women and for men, I think, that um, seeing women in pain and going through that process of giving birth. And, um, one of the things that I do as a doula is try and make sure that women feel supported, not only physically and mentally, but also in a spiritual sense about the process of becoming a mother, because it is about more than just 
that child coming into the world. It's also becoming a family. It's affecting the relationship between a man and a woman. It affects a woman sexually and their partnership. And it also makes you think about, well, how do I want my child to grow up in this world? And what kind of relationship do I want them to have with the environment and with other people? Sorry, I'm just going to get a little drink. And there's a writer called Pam England that wrote a birthing book about, called Birthing from Within. And she talks about birth as the hero's journey. And uh, the hero's journey is um, about preparation for the journey, going through the ordeal and our return. So there's all sorts of um, men that have gone on these hero journey, hero's journeys, King Arthur, Odysseus. But there's also, we can think of birth as the hero's journey. And most women do a lot of preparation for their birth by gathering a huge amount of information, factual information. But there isn't a huge amount of pre preparation for how it will feel to become a mother and what that means. And um, in the book, Birthing from Within, she tries to prepare women for that sort of sacredness of birth. And this is, um, this is me while I was pregnant with my son, who's six months old now, um, at a, what we call a blessing way, which is a little bit like a baby shower, but it's sort of like a spiritual baby shower. So instead of it just being about um, getting gifts from people for your baby. It's about preparing for that journey of becoming a mother. It's about gathering other women around you and um, getting that support and thinking about the sacredness of the journey that you're going to make and actually preparing for that process of, of bringing a baby into the world and, and preparing to become a mother. Okay, so giving birth is remembered for a lifetime. When I wrote the poem that I read to you before and a few other poems that I've written about birth, I um, read them out at a um, group of um, other poets. And there was a woman there sort of in her sort of 60s and um, afterwards, after I read a couple of poems, she came to me in tears because she'd had a very difficult birth experience and, um, and everything that I said sort of brought back her own birth to her. And you talk to women in their sort of 70s, 80s, 90s and the birth of their children is something that they remember forever. They usually can remember even small details about the day in which their child, uh, child or children were born. So that's one reason why giving birth is important. Um, I've got much too many slides to talk in great detail about all of them, so I could probably talk for 18 minutes about every single one of these things, so I'm going to have to skip through them a bit faster than I would have thought. But, um, so I won't talk to you very much in great detail about the physiological process of giving birth, but physiological means being in accordance with the normal processes of a living organism. So giving birth is a bit like conceiving a pregnancy or sneezing or being sick it is an involuntary process going into labor although we can artificially make a woman go into labor scientists don't actually understand what it is that actually triggers a woman to go into labor it's some kind of um, interaction between the baby the placenta and the woman's body but something actually triggers labor to happen physiologically and actually the birth process goes through what they usually describe as three stages where the cervix, the ring of muscle inside the woman that holds the, the womb closed, actually starts to dilate, opens to 10 centimetres, and then muscle contractions push the baby out. And then the third stage of labour is the placenta, which is the organ that has sustained the baby, that joined the baby and the mother's bodies together, being born as well. And I like to argue that there's a fourth stage of labour, which is the first few hours after birth, which is when the baby and the mother have that attachment period where they actually um, bond with each other. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So this is me in labour with my son, Finn. And um, when you are with a woman in labour, when you're supporting a woman in labour, having I've been at about 30 births now, including home births, water births, but also high-risk births in hospitals, caesareans, um, and inductions, all sorts of births. And every, every labour is different. The needs of every woman is different. The needs of the, her partner are different. But all women do go through this process where they sort of go on an internal journey and you can watch them even on programs like one born every minute especially with women that aren't medicated with drugs you can see that actually the natural bodily endorphins kick in and that woman goes into a play into another world in her own mind really she goes into another world 
and that she has to draw on her inner reserves in order to give her the strength to give birth to her child. Um, so giving birth affects women physically. What kind of birth experience a woman has effect, has effects on her that last a lifetime. So somewhere, if a woman gives birth physiologically without needing more intervention, then she can be up and about recovered within a couple of days. You know, obviously you need to rest and be with your baby, but it doesn't necessarily have effects that um, affect you physically for a long period of time. But women that end up having something like a cesarean section or forceps where they have to be cut um, and have an episiotomy can have effects that affect them for weeks, months, the rest of their life. 24% of women in this country end up having a cesarean section for their birth. So for those of you that haven't given birth, that means that possibly up to one in four of you could end up having a cesarean section. The World Health Organization state that, in, um, that 10, only 10% 10 of cesarean sections are really medically necessary. So we wonder why is there such a high rate? And in some countries like Brazil and China, that rate's gone much higher. The cesarean section rate's up to sort of 60, 70, 80% in some countries. So it makes us think about the physical effects on the woman of having major abdominal surgery. So giving birth affects women mentally. This is a poster that I found from an Australian website. If we say no, it is rape, no matter what the setting. Some of you might think that that's a bit full on to be saying that, that women can feel like their birth experience is a kind of rape to them. That um, women go into a medical setting or into a hospital trusting that they will be looked after. I've talked to lots and lots of women about their birth stories and healthy women, healthy pregnancies that walk in without really doing much antenatal preparation, without thinking about how they want to give birth, but they just think, well, I've got to have this baby, I'll go to hospital. And they come out sometimes feeling utterly traumatised by the experience that they had, so much so that I've had women on the phone to me that can't go past the street that the hospital is in that they went past. They can't talk about their birth without having flashbacks about it. They've, you've, you may have seen it on One Born Every Minute or other birth programmes where women are saying no, 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 and there are medical staff that maybe sometimes actually override what the woman's saying and do things to them even though the woman's asking people not to. And although we should, uh, the medical professionals should obtain consent, informed consent from women for any procedure that they do, and obviously, they're thinking of the woman and her baby, but when a woman is, feels like her own wishes are being overridden by somebody else and that they don't have any control over what's happening and they, they feel in danger of their life and their baby's life, they can develop post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the only environmentally um, caused mental health illness. And it's usually seen in things like men coming back from war but actually, we found that women giving birth, between 2 and 5% of women d develop full-on post-traumatic stress disorder. That's up to about 10,000 women a year, and 200,000 others have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so one of the reasons I became a doula was to support women that had had traumatic births and try and help them to have a better experience next time. So this is one of the couples that I've worked with. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to mean a normal birth or a birth, a water birth or a home birth. It could be a planned cesarean, but one in which they feel like their wishes are being heard. Um, so the way in which a woman gives birth affects the way that she feeds her baby. For women that have, think that they want to breastfeed, I've realised that I'm very near the end of the time, but for women that want to breastfeed... If they have had a medical birth, if they've had a cesarean, it can affect an unexpected cesarean, it can affect the way in which they are able to feed their baby and they can be very uncomfortable and it can make them feel unable to breastfeed, which can be very upsetting for women on top of having a traumatic birth experience to not be able to give to feed their baby in the way that they want to and also bond with her baby. So this is one of the women that I work with. I was in a state of shock for quite some time after his birth. I felt I had failed at the first hurdle of motherhood by not being able to cope with labour or give birth naturally. This traumatic experience made quite a lot of difference in how I cared for him in his early weeks. I was nervous and overly anxious. 
This is just a very, I'll just go through these last couple of slides quickly. This is just a, a picture of some women with their buggies, as we've all seen people in the park, babies in hospital all wrapped up, and also a special wonderful device where you don't actually have to hold the bottle for your baby. You can um, put it in this lovely bag in its buggy. And um, it made me think about a day in the life of, of a baby in the Western world and how we're actually trying to separate women from their babies all the time. And that even from birth, that we put the babies in these, well, I call them fish tanks usually, where um, they don't encourage women to hold their babies because they might drop them because they've just given birth. So they have to be within these, these fish tanks. And um, for a woman that's had a cesarean, she then can't pick her baby up because she's um, had an operation, which means that she can't use those muscles, is in a lot of pain. And so every time her baby cries and she wants to feed the baby or the baby shows signs it's hungry, she can't pick the baby up. If we have a look at some women in other countries, what we see is that babies tend to be in arms. They tend to be skin to skin. They don't use buggies. They don't have um, sort of devices that feed their babies for them. They tend to have their babies there. And if we look at the research, having the, the way in which we parent a baby in its first few weeks and in its first year of life has a massive impact on that baby's brain development and on the way in which they have empathy for other people and the way in which they communicate and feel emotion. So ultimately, giving birth affects how a generation is brought up and taught to love each other. And, uh, there we go. and I shall uh, leave this bit now, but um, anyone interested can um, talk to me afterwards about ways in which I feel that births um, could be made better. And um, thank you very much.